Robert Gates is originally from Kansas. He received his baccalaureate degree from the College of William and Mary and, received, and graduated with a master's degree in history from Indiana University. He received his doctorate in Russian and Soviet history from Georgetown University. On completing his graduate work, Dr. Gates joined the Central Intelligence Agency in 1966. He spent the next 27 years there as an intelligence professional serving six presidents. During that period, he spent nearly nine years at the National Security Council serving four presidents of both political parties. Before becoming the CIA director, he deserved director. He served as deputy director of intelligence, chairman of the National Intelligence Council, deputy director of central intelligence, and acting director of central intelligence. He was appointed agency director in November 1991. He retired in January 1993. Dr. Gates is the only career officer in the CIA's history to rise from entry level employee to director and the only intelligence analyst to ever attain the position. He's been awarded the National Security Medal, the Presidential Citizens Medal, has twice received the National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medal, and has received the Distinguished Intelligence Medal, the CIA's highest award, three times. Dr. Gates is a member of the board of directors of several Fortune 500 companies and also serves as a senior advisor or consultant to several investment houses and major international firms. He is a trustee of the Charles Stark Draper Laboratories here in Boston and the Forum for International Policy. He is often interviewed by major television networks here in the United States as well as by the BBC in the United Kingdom. Dr. Gates has lectured across the U.S. and abroad on the topic of intelligence, and tonight he is here to discuss issues addressed in his new book titled From the Shadows, The Ultimate Insider's Story of the Secret 30-Year War with the Soviet Union. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to introduce to you, and would you please join me in welcoming tonight's speaker, Dr. Robert Gates. Thank you all very much. It's a pleasure to be with you here in Boston. Of course, I have to tell you, it's a pleasure to be anywhere but Washington, D.C. You know, where, the place where Senator Alan Simpson says, those who travel the high road of humility encounter little heavy traffic. Where there are so many people lost in thought because it's such unfamiliar territory. Where people say, I'll double cross that bridge when I get to it. The only place in the world where you can see a prominent person walking down Lover's Lane holding his own hand. <laughs> you know, it's a place where people don't listen to each other very much. This goes back a long way. President Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, had a, had a view that this was true, and he decided to test it one time during a reception. And as people were going through the reception line, he would stick out his hand and smile and say under his breath, I murdered my mother this morning. <laughs> And people going through the line would nod and smile and say, that's nice, that's nice. Until he got toward the end of the line and an elderly lady came through and he shook her hand and smiled and said, I murdered my mother this morning. And she stopped and looked at him and then smiled brightly and said, I'm sure she must have deserved it and moved right along. <laughs> it's a city of monuments. I have to tell you that in 27 years, the most monumental things that I saw in Washington were the egos of many of the people that I worked with and for. It was the time Lyndon Johnson had the Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany at the LBJ Ranch. And at one point, Chancellor Earhart looked up at Johnson and he said, well, Mr. President, I suppose you were born in a log cabin. Johnson looked down at him and said, why, no, Mr. Chancellor, I was born in a manger. <laughs> Another time, Johnson gave a stag dinner in the White House, and he asked Bill Moyers to ask the blessing, and Moyers, like a good White House staffer, was seated well down below the salt. Moyers began to pray, and about 30 seconds into the prayer, Johnson raised his head and said, Bill, speak up. I can't hear you. And Moyers, without ever lifting his head, said, Mr. President, that's because I'm not speaking to you. 
or the time that Richard Nixon was meeting with Prime Minister Golda Meir of Israel and it was right after he'd appointed Kissinger as Secretary of State. He said, just think, Madam Prime Minister, we both now have Jewish foreign ministers. And Golda Meir looked him right in the eye and said, yes, but mine speaks English. <laughs> it's also a city of monumental embarrassments. The first state dinner I attended was for the President of Italy, and the entire White House was decorated with hundreds of yellow chrysanthemums, the Italian flower of death. <laughs> second state dinner was for the Chancellor of the Federal Republic of Germany, Chancellor Schmidt, and the after dinner entertainment at the White House was Joel Gray singing highlights from Cabaret. <laughs> Almost five years ago in Moscow, a new era in world history began. In what seemed the twinkling of an eye, the most powerful and ruthless tyranny in history shattered and collapsed. During its death throes, so too ended the Cold War, a great victory for the West and for the United States. My book, From the Shadows, is an eyewitness account of how five presidents and their closest advisors from the Vietnam War until the Soviet collapse took actions and shaped strategies that contributed to that outcome of the Cold War. The story that I tell is a little of James Bond, a little of Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan, a little Forrest Gump, a measure of John Le Carre, and a dollop of danger that none of those fictional heroes ever had to put up with or try to survive, and that is how to survive through five consecutive presidencies on the mean streets of political Washington. The story takes you from Capitol Hill to KGB safe houses in Moscow, from Afghan Mujahideen training camps in Pakistan to Washington, D.C., to Margaret Thatcher's parlor at 10 Downing Street, from CIA training facilities in Virginia to the Forbidden City in Beijing and the German Chancellor's bungalow on the Rhine from the Oval Office to the Kremlin. In this book, behind the accounts of secret missions and political intrigue, and personal conflicts, cravenness and courage, ruthlessness, intelligence operations, clandestine wars, CIA and White House secrets, a variety of crises and plotting. Behind all of these lies a consistent theme, and that is how the Soviet Union collapsed and the part played in that collapse by the United States. This evening I want to try and give you a unique insider's perspective on each of the five presidents for whom I worked and the role that each of them played uh, in this outcome. Richard Nixon hated CIA. He believed that Alan Dulles, CIA director under President Eisenhower, was responsible for the so-called missile gap of the late 1950s. And when President, presidential candidate John F. Kennedy exploited the missile gap so effectively during the 1960 campaign, Nixon was always convinced that it tilted the election to Kennedy. And he never forgave CIA for that. In the book, I refer to detente as the era of smoke and mirrors. For all the rhetoric on both sides of a new relationship and establishing generations of peace, the fact is neither side gave up a single strategic offensive weapons program, and neither side ever gave up a single opportunity to gain an advantage at the expense of the other. Paradoxically, detente and arms control would play a critical role in preserving America's modernization programs for its strategic offensive weapons, thanks in no small part to the political skill of Nixon's Secretary of Defense, Melvin Laird. When one of my predecessors, then DCI under Nixon, Richard Helms, went in to see Helms one time, Laird was leaving the Oval Office, and as Laird shut the door behind him, Nixon leaned over to Helms and said, there goes the most deceptive man in America. It was some accolade considering the source. 
Despite the continued adversarial confrontational relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union during this period of detente, a reality that both Nixon and Henry Kissinger tried to minimize, particularly after 1972, Nixon's detente would have three lasting benefits. First, the process of strategic arms control would come to involve a remarkable dialogue between the superpowers on both nuclear weapons and nuclear strategy that in time would outweigh the value of the agreements themselves. Second, the 1971 agreement on Berlin would essentially eliminate that city as a flashpoint for the remainder of the Cold War. Third, and perhaps the most lasting benefit of Nixon's detente and reaching out to the Soviets, was to begin the process of opening up the Soviet Union to a growing number of American officials, uh, businessmen, journalists, scientists, cultural groups, and others, and eventually tourists, all traveling in increasing numbers to the Soviet Union and establishing direct contact with the Soviet, with the people of the Soviet Union. President Ford increasingly is becoming a historic footnote known primarily for his pardoning of Nixon, his gaffe in answering the question on Poland in the 1976 presidential election debate, and his seeming clumsiness. In fact, when I was working in the Carter White House for uh, Spignev Brzezinski, at times I would tell Brzezinski that none of them would be there if it weren't for me, because I had drafted the Q&A for President Ford to use in that debate. Uh, unfortunately, he fluffed the answer that I gave him. In reality, with Ford's signature of the declaration in Helsinki in 1975, the West began openly to attack and to undermine the legitimacy of the Soviet government in the eyes of its own citizens and those of its empire. As the Declaration and its statements on human rights were publicized, groups throughout the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe were organized not only to publicize those statements, but also the government's failure to live up to the pledges that they had made in Helsinki to meet those standards of human rights. Ford tr took tremendous grief from Americans of East European descent and conservatives for signing the Helsinki Declaration. And I think a strong case can be made that signing that declaration cost him the election in 1976. There were debates in the Ford administration about how to deal with Soviet dissidents. Perhaps the most notorious case was when Alexander Solzhenitsyn visited uh, the United States from Switzerland in 1975. And the decision was made primarily by Kissinger and the State Department not to invite Solzhenitsyn to meet with President Ford. I thought the decision to snub Solzhenitsyn entirely was a mistake. And as a result, I sent a memo to Kissinger saying that I thought if they couldn't have a formal meeting, then perhaps some VIP in the White House could give Solzhenitsyn a tour and it could be managed so that he would at least run into Ford and they could have a brief conversation and a photo. I got the memo back from Kissinger and written across the corner was, are you crazy, HK? A year later, the snub of Solzhenitsyn became a major issue in the primary campaign between Ronald Reagan and Gerald Ford. And just as it was at its hottest, I sent a copy of that first page back with Kissinger's note, Are You Crazy, HK? I sent it back across the, to the west wing of the White House, and I simply wrote on it one word, no. From the shadows portrays a Carter administration which in its approach to the Soviet Union is far different from the conventional wisdom. In truth, Jimmy Carter significantly intensified the external pressures on the Soviet Union in several important arenas. His campaign for human rights and against oppression in the Soviet Union did not stop with public statements. He gave significantly increased resources to the Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, and Radio Liberty to increase their programming and to overcome Soviet jamming. As early as spring 1977, Carter vastly expanded CIA's covert program to smuggle into the Soviet Union books, periodicals, cassettes, and even videotapes 
of Soviet dissident information and literature such as Solzhenitsyn, as well as information on the misdeeds of the Soviet government, literature on democracy, and on the cultural and ethnic history of the peoples of the Soviet Union. Carter's overt and covert efforts contributed to undermining the legitimacy of the Soviet regime in the eyes of its own citizens and its empire. Even as Carter's public efforts were derided in the West, the Soviet leadership and its paranoia saw this threat for what it was and believed that Carter had changed the rules of the game as it had been played for over 25 years. And as such, they saw him as far more than a nuisance, but as a genuine danger to the Soviet system. And they reacted accordingly. The relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union was pervasively at its worst throughout the Carter administration as it would be at any time during the Cold War after the Truman presidency. Carter also began the first serious economic sanctions against the USSR. Early in the administration, in the face of opposition from the state and commerce departments and many businessmen, he imposed restrictions that had the effect of limiting the transfer of sensitive technologies from the West to the Soviet Union. And in one confrontation after another with the Soviets, he imposed an growing number of economic restrictions and severe limits on U.S.-Soviet trade. He didn't intend to wage economic warfare on the Soviets, but the practical effect of his actions was to do that. The Soviets during this period, the latter half of the 1970s, became especially aggressive in the third world, responding to a number of opportunities that presented themselves. Coming so soon after Vietnam, Americans were horrified at the prospect that we might again become involved militarily in a third world conflict. And so although President Ford tried to covertly, through CIA, support the anti-communist, anti-Soviet factions in Angola, the Congress uh, shortly turned off that covert action. And when Carter turned aside and did not do anything when the uh, new communist regime took, uh, carried out a coup in Ethiopia and tens of thousands of Cuban troops began going into Ethiopia, most people were then convinced that the U.S. would in fact do nothing to counter the Soviets in the third world. But then, just as now, everyone was wrong. By 1978, the White House had developed a strategy for dealing with the Soviets in the third world using CIA. But in fact, both CIA and the State Department resisted and blocked these efforts by the White House because of their own disinterest in becoming involved in covert action. A White House perceived to be hostile to CIA by 1978, in fact, was lamenting the lack of boldness and imagination in operational matters at the agency. By spring 1979, Carter was ready to move. He authorized at mid-year a covert action to counter the newly uh, in power government of Maurice Bishop in Grenada. However, the Senate Intelligence Committee would not let him implement it. And so the problem in Grenada would later be dealt with by President Reagan with military forces four years later. Within two weeks of the July 1979 Sandinista victory in Nicaragua, Carter had approved a CIA covert operation to counter them as well as covert action in El Salvador to block the infiltration of Nicaraguan weapons to the Salvadoran insurgents. By the fall of 1979, there were a number of Carter-approved covert actions underway in the Caribbean, Central America, and elsewhere in Latin America to block the Soviets and the Cubans. The roots of programs that would become so controversial in the Reagan administration. Finally, six months before, before the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, Carter authorized covert assistance to the Mujahideen in their efforts to resist the Soviets and the communist government in Kabul. And of course, after the invasion, Carter would expand all of these activities. At one point in 1978, one strategy of the Carter administration was to strike a deal with Cuba, make a deal with Castro that we would drop the embargo if he would forego sending his troops uh, and causing trouble in third world areas. 
to try and make this deal, the Deputy National Security Advisor, with me in his toe, went to New York for a secret meeting with a senior Cuban intelligence officer who was close to Castro. The FBI wired me with microphones for the entire meeting. We met in a very posh New York restaurant. I think it's the only time I ever saw a waiter in a trench coat. I think everybody in the, in the restaurant was armed. There were Cubans there that were not in the party. The Cubans we were having lunch with were both armed. And the place was filled with FBI people. The meeting was a failure. Cubans weren't interested. And what the FBI got was a tape that not only recorded this conversation, but also because of the sensitivity of the microphones, my entire digestive process. <laughs> Finally, in the military arena, Carter would continue every single major strategic offensive weapons program that had been started by Presidents Johnson, Nixon, and Ford, with the sole exception of the B-1 bomber. And he canceled the B-1 because he intended to replace it with an airplane, a bomber, based on new technology, stealth technology. The B-2 bomber was originated in the Carter administration. And it was Carter who gained NATO approval to deploy the new intermediate nuclear forces to Europe in response to the Soviets' SS-20 deployments and took other steps to strengthen the alliance. This high-tech weaponry on occasion produced its own scares. I tell the story in the book about the night that Brzezinski received a call from his military assistant about 2.30 in the morning with a report that he had been told by the National Military Command Center that 220 Soviet missiles had been launched at the United States. Brzezinski, knowing that the president's window of decision was four to six minutes, said that he would wait two minutes to call the president and to get more information. A minute later, the military assistant called and said the first call, first information had been in error. There were not 220 missiles coming, but 2,200 nuclear warheads were on their way to the United States. I don't know what Brzezinski thought in the middle of the night, knowing or believing that the whole world would be destroyed within a handful of minutes. He never woke his wife. About 30 seconds before he was to pick up the phone and call Carter, and having confirmed that Sachs bombers were already in the air, he got a call from his military assistant saying that our satellites weren't picking up launches, that in fact it looked like it had been an error, a computer glitch. In some Contrary to the conventional wisdom, in attacking the legitimacy and oppressive policies of the Soviet government, resorting to economic warfare, tackling the Soviets covertly in the third world, and pressing ahead in the military arena, especially a high-tech strategic competition, Carter set the stage and laid the foundations for much of what Ronald Reagan would do. A reality neither president nor any of his supporters is yet willing to admit. As I watched Ronald Reagan for eight years in the White House, in good years and bad, I saw he had a strategic vision and a historical optimism that was unparalleled by any of the other presidents for whom I had worked. His grasp of strategy and timing and negotiating was excellent. His understanding of the forces of history and foreign affairs was fairly primitive but basically on target. He alone in that administration truly believed that the Soviet Union was teetering on the brink of collapse, and he alone believed that it was not going to happen in some vague future, but that it could actually happen during his presidency. And so after January 1981, programs that Carter had approved or pursued without enthusiasm and without often without adequate resources, Reagan built upon and expanded hugely with a single objective, and that was to push a Soviet Union in crisis over the edge. Economic sanctions adopted by Carter were strengthened and expanded. 
The Carter-initiated covert actions against the Soviets and Cubans in the Third World became a vast worldwide campaign by the early 1980s in Angola and Nicaragua and elsewhere in Central America, in Afghanistan, in Ethiopia and elsewhere, in Cambodia. Soviet clients were being challenged at home and demanding more and more help from Moscow. In the military sphere, a modest increase in the defense budget in 1980 under Carter became a huge military buildup under Reagan in the early years, as strategic programs were continued and accelerated and expanded. The continuing U.S. military modernization in the 1970s and the huge American military buildup in the early 1980s put enormous pressure on the Soviets and compelled them to sustain their defense spending at a very high level and even in certain areas selectively increase it, even at a time when their economy was in growing crisis. In some, coincident with a significant worsening of economic and social conditions in the Soviet Union in the mid to late 1970s and the early 1980s, the United States under these presidents became significantly more aggressive in exploiting and attacking the most important vulnerabilities of the Soviet system. The economy, a technology-based arms race, the illegitimacy of the regime and its repression of its citizens, the growing discontent of the diverse peoples of the Soviet Union, and the contest in the Third World. These simultaneous pressures on a regime already reeling from basic systemic weaknesses and the inadequacies and mistakes of its leaders contributed critically to the realization in the Kremlin in the early 80s that change, real, far-reaching reform, had to be carried out if the Soviet Union was to sustain its power at home and its empire abroad. And once that decision to begin real reform was made, the ultimate inevitable doom of the Soviet system was greatly accelerated. Fortunately for this country and for the world, in my view, it fell to George Bush to lead the industrial democracies during the death throes of the Soviet empire. At no time in history has an empire so vast, so ancient, and so well armed collapsed so quickly and with such little bloodshed. From the liberation of Eastern Europe to the reunification of Germany to the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union, I believe that Bush's skilled statecraft and his personal relationships with other leaders made a highly unstable and revolutionary time seem much less dangerous than it really was. In the national security arena, he was terrific to work for. Not only his own skills, but the remarkable team that he gathered around him, Baker, Cheney, Powell, Scowcroft, and others. People who provided sound advice, hashed out their differences in private, and then loyally followed the president once he had made his decisions. They always kept their perspective and their sense of humor. The sense of humor was especially important. It was important under all these presidents. No one seems to pay much attention to that. One of the sources of humor in the Bush administration was the remarkable penchant of Brent Scowcroft, the national security advisor under both Ford and Bush, to fall asleep in meetings with the president, including with foreign leaders. And so the president established an award in his honor, the Scowcroft Award, and it was to the American official who went to the American official who in any meeting ostentatiously and obviously fell asleep. The president's scoring criteria were the duration of the nap, the intensity of the nap, and the quality of the recovery. One year the Secretary of Defense won the award. One time we were seated on the couch in the Oval Office, Baker, Scowcroft and me, Ford was talking to a foreign leader. Scowcroft fell asleep. He woke up, moved forward on the couch and put his elbows on his knees. He fell asleep again. His elbows fell off his knees. He pitched forward and like a driver with a child next to him, I stuck my hand out and stopped him about a foot from the flower pot in the middle of the coffee table and kind of eased him back onto the chair. 
Bush never missed a beat. While these five presidents all immeasurably increased the pressures on a Soviet Union in systemic crisis, it was Mikhail Gorbachev who would actually bring down the Soviet system. The collapse of the Soviet Union may have been inevitable, but it was not necessarily inevitable in 1991. Its demise was precipitated by Gorbachev, a leader who set out in 1985 to save the Soviet Union and who instead destroyed it. His tenure as the last Soviet leader is the embodiment of the law of unintended consequences. His policies and actions intended to correct the mistakes and problems of his predecessors and give new life to a reformed Soviet Union surely sealed its fate and accelerated its doom. And when I had the temerity to point that out in public, he then tried to get me fired. Let me just say a word now about CIA. This book reveals more about the real CIA, its internal politics, what it does, how it does it, its differences, its difficulties, than anything you will have ever read. CIA, like the presidents it served, was embattled all through the last half of the Cold War. I describe in detail for the first time many of its successes, successes that you will have not read about, as well as its extraordinary record in forecasting the collapse of the Soviet Union, contrary to all the conventional wisdom. I remember in a briefing in 1985 where one of our analysts was forecasting just exactly this outcome six years before it happened, and in the middle of the briefing I was seated next to Reagan and I heard this tremendous whine, and Reagan's eyes got kind of big and he reached up and adjusted his hearing aid. And the briefing went on another minute or two and there was another and his eyes got as big as saucers and he reached up and he took the hearing aid out of his ear and pounded it in his palm and then as he was putting it back in turned to me and smiled and said it was my KGB handler. I talk a good deal in this book about intelligence wars, about efforts by the KGB to pin the AIDS virus and the assassination of Rajid Gandhi and the sale of baby parts from the third world for organ transplants in the industrialized West, all put about by the KGB as being the responsibility of CIA. And I talk about some of the things we did to them too. I talk about our assistance to solidarity and about our secret summit meetings in Washington and Moscow. I'm also brutally candid about CIA's failures. With the vantage now of several years, since the end of the Cold War, what lessons can we derive from this victory? First, the key to sustaining a consistent policy for decades was, our, was bipartisanship and more continuity than any of our political leaders were ever willing to acknowledge. The fact is that in dealing with today's problems, the long-term strategies and policies needed to deal with difficulties here at home and abroad spanning several presidencies cannot be sustained without that kind of bipartisanship and continuity, without bridges between our parties. And unfortunately, it seems to me this year there's been a lot more bridge burning than bridge building going on. Second, the last half of the Cold War shows that real progress in dealing with challenges is most often made by presidents providing courageous leadership, often against the indications of the public opinion polls. When Jerry Ford went to Helsinki and signed the declaration, all the major newspapers, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and others, said it was a terrible mistake. We now know that the declaration marked the beginning of the end of the Soviet Empire. When Carter undertook his human rights campaign against the Soviets, all the experts and all the pundits said that they thought it was naive and it would surely fail. And we now know that his efforts and those later by Ronald Reagan helped fracture the legitimacy of the Soviet government at home. When in 1981 Ronald Reagan said he thought the Soviet Union was vulnerable and doomed to collapse, people thought it was ridiculous. No political leader who failed truly to lead, even at great potential political cost, 
ever made much of a mark on history. The third lesson of the last decades of the Cold War is that for the most part, our presidents care more, work harder, and are better than the public knows. From Ford's supposed clumsiness to Carter and the killer rabbit to Reagan and his oversimplifications to Bush's fractured syntax, we seem to work awfully hard at diminishing our presidents. This isn't new in American politics by any means, but it has become more vicious. It got more vicious every year I was in Washington, and with today's mass media, it makes it awfully difficult for a president to galvanize the American people to address the nation's problems. The fourth and last lesson I will mention is that neither Americans nor their government can turn their backs and walk away from the rest of the world. Contrary to our fondest hopes for enduring peace after the end of the Cold War, once again we have to face the reality of continuing conflict and ambitious governments around the world, discontented regimes determined to change the global status quo by force if necessary. We have to face the reality that only America can preserve the peace. Further, our extraordinary integration with the global economy and dependence upon it demands of us a continuing global leadership role. We can no longer pretend to ourselves for the fifth time in this century that we can abandon the burdens of that role and do it safely. If we learn the lessons of the outcome of the Cold War, then I am convinced that we can solve our problems here at home and preserve the peace and advance democracy, liberty, and economic prosperity around the world. An America that fought and won the nearly half-century struggle with the Soviet Union surely can meet and overcome the challenges that we face today. Thank you very much. Now Dr. Gates will take your questions. If you have a question or a comment, please come down to uh, the microphones located uh, on the front of either aisle. And I'm sure uh, many of you are dying to uh, ask some uh, pointed questions, but please, uh, Dr. Gates has to catch a plane, so we have a very tight schedule, so please keep your questions succinct and short. We, we did win the Cold War, but we paid a terrible price in many ways. I wondered if you can mention any, any activities that the Soviet Union engaged in to make us pay such a price. Do you think they had anything to do with our involvement or the, 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 the debacle of Vietnam, uh, with riots in the cities, with uh, the oil crises, with uh, our inflation over the past 40 years? Do you think that they were trying to do and succeeded in doing any of the things that the CIA managed to uh, do to them? I think of the uh, examples that you cited, I don't know of any in which we ever had any evidence that the Soviets had a hand. Do you think they uh, were trying? I, there's no doubt in my mind that they would have liked to and that they may have made some modest effort, but I have never seen any document or heard any former Soviet official or intelligence officer or seen any other evidence that would suggest they had any significant influence in doing that at all. Thank you. Dr. Gates, I'd like to thank you for, uh, for speaking here tonight. Um, everybody speaks of the Cold War as if it's over, of course, but uh, with the rising communism in the Eastern Europe, in such nations as Romania and Bulgaria, and then, of course, the rising Communist Party in the Soviet Union, and, uh, and with Zuganov possibly coming back to power, do you see a potential rise in uh, conflict between the United States and, the Soviet, or, and Russia again, then, if the communists do come to power? I think that we will not see the kind of aggressive uh, imperialist uh, policies on the part of Russia that were characterized by the Soviet communist system. Uh, I think that while the governments, both the Russian and American governments have put the emphasis on the positive, particularly on macroeconomics in Russia, 
the reality is that the Soviet economy is in a horrible mess. Um, the uh, GNP has shrunk by somewhere between a third and a half since 1991. Uh, virtually the entire industrial plant is outmoded. Uh, if they were slipping behind in terms of military technology in the late 1980s, mid to late 1980s, that gap has multiplied many fold at this point. Uh, and I think the condition of the Russian military today is best illustrated by the difficulties they've had in Chechnya. So I think that it'll be a long time before the Russians present the kind of, uh, if ever, before the Russians present the same kind of uh, national security concern to this country that they did under the communists. That said, I think that this country has to come to grips with the reality that two of the powers that are discontented with the international status quo today are Russia and China. And the implications of that and their growing cooperation and sharing of military technologies and military sales from Russia to China and the incredibly complex dimensions of as we look at China and see the economic allure of doing business there at the same time that it has had that, that our economic involvement has had no impact on liberalizing their society internally or tempering their aggression externally. I think there are a lot of national security challenges that face this country, uh, but I think they are not of the magnitude that we saw in the Cold War of of the survival of mankind. They are more in the nature of, of the kinds of tra more traditional ambitions that we saw before the rise of communism and Nazism, but they will be problems we'll have to deal with nonetheless. Sir. Thank you for your talk. On a slightly different subject, I wanted to ask you what your opinion was on the treatment of Saddam Hussein and Desert Storm and whether or not we went far enough in our decision to pull back. I chaired the group in the White House as Deputy National Security Advisor that established uh, or recommended the war aims for the United States in the war. The f we considered three and adopted two. The two that we resolved within minutes was to uh, expel the Iraqis from Kuwait and second to destroy the um, Republican Guard, the uh, offensive arm of the Iraqi military. The one that took us weeks to debate was whether to make a war aim of changing the regime in Baghdad. And ultimately we recommended against it and that was the decision that the president made. And the reason was, first of all, we didn't want to make a war aim of something we weren't sure we could accomplish. Don't forget this same group of people only 10 months before had ended up losing Noriega in Panama in a country that was much smaller, much weaker, where we had much better intelligence and much larger military uh, facilities and capabilities. Saddam was not going to sit on his veranda in Baghdad waiting for the 24th Mechanized Division to come pick him up. And so we had to face the prospect that if that was our aim, we would end up occupying most of Iraq and a large American force would probably still be there to this day. It's an unfortunate outcome, I have to tell you. We all had our fingers crossed every time we bombed a command and control bunker. But the fact is uh, that we did not make it a war aim, um, and it's too bad that he's still there and the people that pursued the war against him, both in Europe and the United States, are gone. Thank you. Next question. Um, with the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union, some people, namely Senator Moynihan, have called for the end of the CIA. What do you see as the future of the CIA, and what were the implications of the Ames case on the future of the CIA? I think that the future of the agency is, is actually much brighter than the press would convey, uh, than the editorial and, and commentary press would convey. And all I would uh, adduce as my evidence of that are stories, for example, in the New York Times over the past six weeks to two months, where we've seen that CIA uh, brought forward, the, found the information that proved that China had sent the technologies for ballistic missiles and for making nuclear weapons to Iran and to uh, Pakistan. It was CIA that brought forward the information the administration is using showing that the security of nuclear material in Russia has deteriorated. 
It was CIA that took down the Cali cartel. It was CIA that was in the forefront in the terrorist summit that President Clinton attended uh, at Sharm el Sheikh uh, just a few weeks ago and that leads the counterterrorism uh, campaign. So it, it, there was a CIA analyst on Secretary Brown's plane, an economic analyst, uh, there at Secretary Brown's insistence. And CIA officers almost go with almost all senior administration officials on overseas trips. So it looks to me like the Clinton administration is making very effective use both of CIA and of American intelligence uh, as it pursues uh, the various challenges around the world. I think that in itself is perhaps the best evidence of the continuing valuable role being played by the agency, a role that, uh, for which it doesn't get much credit in public. And I would just say on Ames, Ames will always be a terrible blot on the agency. The, the reality is no one should have been surprised that there was a mole. You always have to assume that there's a bad apple. Where the agency is the most culpable is in how long it took them to find him and to take action against him uh, while he was still operating. That's where I think the, the real problem lies. And in some respects, the solution to that already is significantly in place. Because my view is the main reason that Ames was able to operate as long as he did was not, well, it was partly for the little operational problems and difficulties that they've cited that were overlooked. But the real reason he survived so long was because of, was because of hubris. The reality is that the reason he lasted so long is because nobody in the agency, perhaps other than the director and the deputy director, believed that the Soviets could penetrate CIA that illusion is shattered forever. And my guess is that you would not want to bet a dollar that there is not another mole. But I think there's a very different approach to looking for them now. Could you comment on the Boland Amendment and to what extent it was against the interests of the United States? In the book, I, I devote considerable attention to Central America and to the struggle between the administration, and I really characterize three parties in it. The administration, the Congress, and CIA. And very briefly, my view is that I hold both the, administration, the Reagan administration and the Congress culpable for failing to address the problem of Nicaragua head-on. Neither one of them was really ready to make, neither the Congress nor the President were willing to make it a major political issue that they were prepared to take to the country. And so both the President and the Congress indulged themselves in half measures that sent very mixed signals to the people in the field. You can do this, but you can't do this. We reached a point at one in the third Boland Amendment where not even the lawyers that drafted it understood what the implications of it were. We had people from the field actually going to the Hill with specific proposals and saying to the staffs, is this allowed or not? And memos would go back and forth on the Hill of trying to sort out whether these kinds of things were allowed. So I think that the administration and the Congress dealt CIA a really lousy hand in terms of, of a problem that they wouldn't deal with head on. As I say in the book, I think the agency then took a lousy hand and played it amazingly stupidly. I think that the Boland Amendments were a legitimate approach to dealing with a problem, but I think the administration made a mistake in cutting compromises and deals on the Boland Amendment that made it very difficult for the people in the field to try and deal with it. They should have just, both of them should have dealt with the Nicaraguan problem straight up. Are we going to try and do something about the regime in Managua or not? instead of playing all the games that we did over a period of four or five years. The trouble is the Congress never wanted to take a cut and dried stand saying we won't stand for it, and the administration was never willing to take it to the country. I would like to know your opinion on the picture missing or the distorted or true to fact, especially since this Marxist Chilean government was the democratically elected government. I'm sorry, the first picture missing was a distorted or true to fact. Are you familiar with the picture? No. Uh, a movie called Missing? Oh, no, I'm, I'm not familiar with it. I'm sorry. sorry. Okay. Um, Dr. Gates, actually, I was wondering, um, 
Where do you stand on the concept or the idea that with the demise of the Soviet Union and with it, its control over many third world nations, the amount and frequency of low intensity conflicts involving US forces will increase? I think that the, <clears throat> the general view of uh, the American people is one of reluctance to see U.S. forces, particularly U.S. ground forces, involved in any kind of a military operation that is open-ended. I think that when you see the resistance to the deployment of American troops in Bosnia and the commitments the president had to make in terms of getting them out within a year and the, and the effort that the military is putting in to avoid mission creep as happened in Somalia and you look at the reaction to what happened in, to our troops in Somalia I think that, I think that Americans are generally uh, skeptical of deploying American ground forces uh, to third world countries where the mission is vague and, and the duration of their commitment is open-ended. I think they are more willing to contemplate actions of the kind that are overwhelming in force, short in duration, and bringing uh, the soldiers out quickly. And I think presidents and the Congress will, will uh, be very careful about how they approach that. So no, I don't see a significant increase in the deployment of American forces along those lines. I think we have time for about uh, two more quick questions. Uh, sir? In the name of stopping communism, would you comment on the assassination of Patrice Lumumba and the career of Joseph Mobutu? I think that one of the best things that happened to U.S. intelligence and to CIA, contrary to the views of many of my colleagues, were the congressional investigations of 1975. Because I think that they began a process of grounding American intelligence, uh, first of all, in law, but second, with a far different kind of oversight by the Congress than had existed before. I also think that President Ford's executive order banning assassination, <clears throat> and for those of you who don't know, the, uh, one of the assassinations attributed to the agency was of P Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. I think that... Consider, consider that correct, sir. I'm sorry? Would you, you said attributed to... Well, to, to tell you the truth, I don't... Rem I, I was still in high school at the time, and I don't remember specifically where the Assassinations uh, Commission came out on it, but that certainly is the, that, that the presumption that that was the case has always been mine, but I don't know for 100%. But when Ford issued his executive order against assassinations, I have always thought that was right. <clears throat> in dealing with the Libyans and others during the late 80s and early 90s, in dealing with Saddam, the issue was addressed to me personally again about whether that executive order ought to be lifted. And my view has always been that the assassinations prohibition ought to, ought to stay in place and that uh, assassination was not an appropriate uh, instrument of foreign policy for the United States of America. Mobutu is a, I'm happy to say, is more an American foreign policy problem than it is an intelligence problem. Uh, what he has done to that country is, is a disgrace. Uh, and quite frankly, the way he has continued to sustain himself in, himself in power uh, is a disgrace. I, I personally think that the time has long since come and gone when most of the governments of the world ought to have essentially isolated Mobutu and done what they could, I think, not through covert action uh, to force him out. Thank you. I would just like to say that on the other side of that coin, what, <clears throat> what Patrice Lumumba could have done for that country as opposed to castigating Mobutu, which I agree with you on, but that's the other side of that coin. Last question. Hi, Dr. Gates. Um, my question is, well, as you were speaking, you mentioned that Mikhail Gorbachev was appalled by your mentioning that his um, 
at his trying to save the Soviet Union brought its demise, you know, and just trying to save its people, the regime and everything, it brought the demise of the Soviet Union. What I'm wondering is, do you not feel that maybe his steps were indeed trying to save the, the people from the submissive regime that was undergoing for so many decades? Oh, I give, I give Gorbachev a lot of credit. What, what made him mad was that I said he would fail. He thought he could reform Soviet communism and make it work. And, and I said I thought that would fail. That's what made him mad. I think, <clears throat> I tell, I describe in the book a memorandum that I sent to Bush when I was Deputy National Security Advisor in, 19, in July of 1990, warning Bush about relying too exclusively on Gorbachev and warning that Gorbachev might well not be in power uh, a year or two hence. And I used the line in there, and you'll have to forgive my poetic license, but, uh, but I used the line in there that I cite in the book, that in many respect, Gorbachev is like a Soviet Moses, who having delivered his people from the bondage of Stalinism, had not the vision to carry them over into the promised land. Gorbachev destroyed Stalinist communism in Russia, in the Soviet Union. And in so doing, in my view, and what I say in the book, gave the Russians and the peoples of the Soviet Union a future. And I think that will always be his glory. His inability to see a new political system and a new way of economics was his tragedy. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Dr. Gates for joining us tonight. Uh, Dr. Gates' schedule is extremely tight, but he will be signing copies of uh, From the Shadows uh, back in the, there's a room off the uh, lobby in the auditorium. And please be sure and join us for the next and the last program in the Ford Hall Forum Spring uh, Lecture Series. On Thursday, May 16th, Boston Globe columnist Patricia Smith will be at Faneuil Hall discussing Invisible Boston, facets of the city few people see. Thanks for coming.